G'day legends, I hope that you're having a fantastic day and so far a fantastic week. Now yesterday we spoke about Ukraine and today we're going to speak about Israel. And interestingly, the amount of audience that was actually interested in Israel when I was over there is seemingly really cut away to much smaller, maybe as this war drags on, similar to what we actually saw in Ukraine. That said, we'll continue these videos and continue the updates as we go, or at least until I get back into Israel, if I can get all the uh, accreditations, whatever sorted, to then enter the Gaza Strip. Now, it has been a couple of days since we have had a look, and the war, of course, continues raging on, and casualties continue to climb. Now, sources inside Gaza claim that the death, hot, death toll has surpassed 19,400 and the IDF toll, at least from the invasion now, is 120, with some speculating the casualties of soldiers and the deaths of soldiers is much higher than this, especially the success we are still seeing Hamas having with the amount of senior NCOs and officers being taken out inside Gaza. And from an infantry myself, infantryman myself, seeing these numbers, seeing these majors, captains, lieutenant colonels taken out compared to the amount of uh, privates, lance corporals, corporals, is very surprising in that. I wouldn't be surprised if we do see larger numbers start coming out of those frontline troops. Now, people say that's because these officers fight from the front. That is just stupid. That is not how things work. If in a, strate a strategic tactical sense, a captain, a major, Whatever on the battlefield is much more important than a private or a corporal. That's why we, at the private and corporal level, you're the ones through the doors and the officers because they're commanding the whole thing. That's just the way it is. One thing I did get wrong is um, in the IDF, you are posthumously uh, given a one rank higher. So a major will be then put down as a lieutenant colonel. I am 95% sure that's how it is. But Hamas is still able to fire multiple rocket salvos out of Gaza each and every day and still has a lot of movement inside Gaza. And we see many, many videos of numerous ambushes against IDF troops, especially bunched up there as well. So there's still a lot of freedom of movement there for Hamas after two and a half months of war. It's surprising to see that still able to do with the amount of ISR, of course, uh, drones especially, and people on the ground, actually just the surveillance of that area, it's very surprising, still able to have that amount of movement. But we do see too, I think people don't understand how complex a urban warfare environment actually is. Like it's a full three-dimensional environment. It's down in this, up, left and right, 360 around you. That's why it's the battle space. It's up, it's down, it's all around. And an urban environment like this is incredibly complex to fight in. And I'm actually very surprised we haven't seen much higher casualties of soldiers in an environment like this built up, how difficult that actually is. Of course, we're seeing a lot of engagement with not only small arms, a lot of RPGs into tanks and soldiers outside of tanks as well. And then Cornet missiles. Cornet, of course, anti-tank guided munitions have a long, long way. They can travel very, very far and are incredibly deadly. So, you know, in, in some way tight packed like this, you can still keyhole one of those kilometers down and hit something. And an urban environment is incredibly complex to fight. And I know when I first talked about if there'd be an IDF invasion into Gaza, of course, when I was first there, you know, the troops hadn't actually entered Gaza yet, I predicted that it would be in the hundreds or thousands of killed. So that 120 plus number is actually still, for me, surprisingly low, I think, for the amount of combat we're actually seeing in here. Now, oh my God, we have seen some footage come out and we're going to look over Palestine Square. We're going to look over the tunnel systems and talk about then uh, the hostages who were killed also. Now, Galani's fighters have taken over and destroyed the central square in the Shijaya neighborhood, also known as Palestine Square, where Hamas erected a statue glorifying the APC disaster from the Tsuk Etzan. So let's have a look at this video, then we'll talk about that, as I've got an itchy bloody nose. So this bulldozer here, of course, this is an M113 vehicle here. This was erected by Hamas to celebrate that. And it is then pulled over and destroyed. 
can see the Macava tank sitting out the side here. So, let's see what this was actually put up with. And I think this is interesting because, one, it's interesting where it is. But then secondly, I think it's actually being spoken about in the wrong area. So firstly, let's speak about why this was actually put up. So, of course, Palestine Square here. So in 2014, the IDF, this APC, M113, broke down in the middle of an operation. And as a result, seven soldiers were killed when the APC was hit with a rocket before they could actually be evacuated from then. We've actually seen very similar circumstances happen inside Gaza since the beginning of this. Now, let's have a look at where this is. Now, I believe that this is right here. So I believe it is in, let's have a look, zoom out. So this is Shajaya district, that it is at where this corner of the, see how this rolls around this corner here? I believe that this building is this building here. That is of my belief. Now, of course, this is Palestine Square here, and we're looking in this direction here, where Palestine Square, well, that is one of them, the one I've seen people talking about is, uh, where am I? Right here. So people say that this right here is Palestine Square, but I believe different spot. I could be completely wrong in my analysis there, but I think that I am correct just of where, of course, these two locations are. Of course, this is the district we are talking about, but it, I had to pulling my hair out going, this doesn't line up. And then this area here, this large roundabout, we have known this has been occupied by Israeli forces for a long time. On the 8th of December, this was posted. Basically, it'd become a parking lot for Macava tanks. And of course, we see the Israeli flag in the middle and looks a fair bit more built up than the area we were speaking about. That, it, But that was just me pulling out my hair for a long time there. Now, the IDF has also released this video showing just the extent of the tunnel networks underneath Gaza. Now let's have a look at what the RDF said about this. Massive tunnel system branches out and spans well over four kilometres. Its entrance is located at 400 metres uh, from the Erez crossing, used by Gazans on a daily basis to enter Israel for work and medical treatment in Israeli hospitals. This tunnel system was a project led by Mohammed Zinwa, the brother of Hamas leader Yaha Zinwa, and the commander of Hamas's Khan Yunus Battalion. So let's have a look at where the Erez crossing is. So the Erez border crossing is up here so it says only 400 what did it say uh 400 meters from the crossing so very very close here now we were standing for those aware we were standing just here somewhere just about here so not very far away and it gives you an idea of this area in bed noon here now Something I will talk about this, this is where we saw a lot of the bombing when we were here and around this area. This is where we we're observing into. There's been uh, a lot of controlled demolitions then take place here. So, of course, the bombing has taken place, the troops have moved through, and then basically everything that was left there has been control, uh, de or controlled demolition in this to bring down any remaining buildings, everything in there. It's been a brutal thing, and that is basically just rubble flattened through that whole region. But let's then have a look at the tunnel system. You just see the extent of these insane systems that are underneath here. So the ability to drive through like a bloody mine shaft. So of course this is Hamas footage recovered by IDF Intel. And these are these are very impressive. Like then this network, things like this are incredibly difficult to fight. And you know, people span People say they span absolutely everywhere, and this is why we've seen the IDF also flooding areas like this, because to go down in there as a combat soldier is incredibly risky also. So you can see them showing areas that could be you know, locked off, used as cells as well. And just the extent, this is of course under a shed here of where the entrance is coming 
and going and just how far down these actually lead as well we'll see then the idf here looking at one of the entrances to this so unbelievably extensive of these networks that run underground now al jazeera report that hamas is now recruiting in lebanon through what they say announcements in the country's palestinian refugee camps and mosques there now of course in lebanon is the iranian proxy group hezbollah who are significantly more deadly than hamas both in numbers funding and training and southern lebanon is almost completely controlled by hezbollah now halal khan a professor of political science at the american university of beirut has told al jazeera hezbollah is trying to enlist the support of sunni groups in its fight against Israel from southern Lebanon. Reporting last year, the Hamas leadership revealed the existence of a joint security room for those so-called Axis of Resistance, an Iranian-affiliated military coalition that includes Hamas and Hezbollah, among other groups. Some analysts believe it could be based in Lebanon. And in April 23, Hamas chief Ismail Haniyeh visited Hezbollah uh, leader Hassan Nasrallah in Bay route and this of course plays into exactly what we have spoken about in this conflict that israel was damned if it did and damned if it didn't in response of course to the hamas october 7th attack into israel the israeli population was absolutely livid about what occurred on that day and rightfully so not only at the actions of hamas but also the intelligence services and the idf failings that occurred in the 12 or more months leading up to that at the end of the day the military, the local forces, the intelligence services, they're there to keep the nation and keep civilians safe. That is their primary job of the nation. And there was a complete failure in that whole network there. Now, people say, well, they're questions for after the war. That said, with the response now, they're questions for now. How the hell did that actually then occur? Of course, it wasn't a single, it wasn't a single incident that missed. It was October 7th led up for many many months before that and it was a complete failure there so of course the civilians asking what the hell actually happened so if israel didn't have any response the civilian population would lose all faith in those services and if they did respond well it's what we've seen now at this cam the campaign that has absolutely united so much hate against israel like we've never seen before and has radicalized people in far greater numbers than the hamas militants that the idf is eliminating and just look at the increase around this area of the world we have houthi rebel group picking up their action hezbollah and several other groups of course really upping their attacks day to day and the houthis in this they have massively increase their targeting of civilian ships in the red sea using iranian missiles now this is causing havoc for consumer goods as many of the world's top shipping companies and oil giants have been scared off from the area and this is an incredibly busy and crucial area and this further exacerbates the rising cost of living around the world with bp saying on monday that it has decided to temporarily pause all transits through the red sea including shipments of oil liquid natural gas and other energy supplies and it is absolutely crucial that this remains open for world trade so let's actually have a look here now of course this supplies between asia and Europe. So, of course, across here we have then Asia, here's Australia, India, and then if we come through here, this is, of course, then Suez Canal. So, ships can come through Suez Canal up to here. Now, interesting thing, this is where we see all the piracy really occur. If they can't enter the Red Sea here, or well, the ship's only other option is really down along across South Africa and then up to Europe, extending the journey very very significantly in this area so let's have a look over some of what is happening here now u.s defense secretary lloyd austin has announced the creation of a multinational operation to safeguard commerce stating this is an international challenge that demands collective action therefore today i am announcing the establishment of operation prosperity guardian an important new multinational security initiative this coalition includes bahrain canada france Italy, netherlands norway such least of course a small country in africa spain and the uk also asked for australian support but it's so far australia isn't sending any warships here to support this and you can actually look at 
Uh, this is the entire um, statement of Lloyd Austin from the Pentagon. And we can see the amount of ships that are moving in here. So we see the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower that on December the 15th, 18th, it's moving further and further in closer to the Red Sea through this piracy corridor that we spoke about before. And we can just see the amount of ships in this area. Of course, this is the Red Sea here. Suez Canal is up through here. This is Israel. That's just the amount of French, UK, uh, American ships currently in this area to intercept those missiles and keep those shipping lanes open. Keeping this open is incredibly important for world trade. And I would have no surprise at all if we saw a larger military operation launched against the Houthis of just how important through that Suez Canal actually is. Now, last time we spoke about the three Israeli hostages who were engaged and killed by Israeli IDF forces, which is just absolutely shocking of that to happen and brings a lot of concern forward if these people had white flags, they're undressed and they were engaged there's complete incompetence of whoever was on the ground and engaged there. They have no sympathy for anything that has happened there. Now, I'll put this whole video on the Telegram if you'd like to go and watch, but the Chief of the General Staff, uh, Herzi Halave, has said, you see two people. They are with hands up and without shirts. Take two seconds, and I want to tell you something just as important. And if it's two Gazans with a white flag coming out to surrender, why would we shoot them? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's not the IDF. And many, many people have speculated over exactly what has happened here. But it is a really, really bad look. And it is absolutely heartbreaking as what has happened to those hostages held for a number of weeks. And then this be the fate that actually happens to them from the IDF. And also that if they're engaging people that are unarmed, white flag stripped down that is a huge concern also and there needs to be a lot of internal looking and those who made that uh, that decision to, to do that go by the rightful uh, military and criminal proceedings right so now we're going to have a look at the maps at where uh, Israel the IDF has actually moved up to as they're getting a lot of territory fairly quickly through Gaza and I'm of the opinion that they need to do this quickly because the amount of support there how long they can actually keep this going for I believe is limited. The IDF can keep this war going. They've got weapons, people, equipment. That's not the problem. The just political diplomatic fallout from what is happening here is huge. And eventually, America's hand, I believe, will be forced. So let's have a look at where they're closing up some of these gaps. We've talked about this gap up here near uh, the Indonesian Hospital. And then, of course, down in the Shujar District, which we just spoke about before, moving into more of the centre of Jabalaya now so let's have a look at what then the idf actually says so the idf made advances in rimal and shijay districts in the bet Hanun town so let's have a look at where these districts are and i'll show you a little bit as we go so we'll bring up this map then this is up in this area around here so we can see that they've made an amount of ground up near ramal here and as well near bet Hanun as well so this is this area and this area that they are continuing that quick push up through these districts now i know it looks like well you know why not just close this gap because the amount of fighting the amount of movement through here is very very slow in an urban built-up environment like this and what will be more is you'll clear a block at a time that each platoon section whatever will have a block to clear clear one clear one and move on through so very slow methodical here but i do believe that some of the mistakes we're seeing could be because there is a rush happening and also we do know that areas are clear but there's nothing stopping that there's a tunnel entrance here that can engage out this way and that is i believe of what a lot of what we're seeing where we're seeing guys pretty much you know, behind the line still getting hit behind that like very very first line at least getting engaged now let's then have a look at the next one so idf entered the towns of zahara and uh, mugaraka so let's have a further look at where this is so so zahara is down the bottom here so we're talking about is al zahara right here that they're continuing of course this push to the south past where the split of the north and south of gaza actually is now we'll see further down in this district here, we spoke a lot about trying to close off both this way and in here and 
actually isolate these areas, which these are strategically isolated at the moment, but there will be some movement through between here, which is still an issue, but not have trying to isolate these areas here as well. Of course, this exacerbates for the civilians in there, but also is closing in uh, on the Hamas militants working in here as well. Let's have a look. There was this push. This is in the uh, Shajir district that we did speak about. And then we need to actually move down into the south. We've looked a little bit of everywhere. You can see just when it's sort of more open ground here, how much ground can actually be made compared to in you know, really heavily built up urban environments. Yes, I know everywhere in here is heavily built up, but of course areas are more than others. So let's have a look here. The IDF took control over Al Qud roundabout in the town of Khan Yunus on the southern front. So let's have a look at where this roundabout is. Here we have the roundabout. As we do know, that the IDF has been moving along this road here, both to the north and south at times. So they're moving down here. As we know that this was opened up here, and this was a push actually out this way at the time. Well, fuck, leave me alone. And this was pushed in here when we did speak about this to try and close this gap here that we did speak about, and as well this push here. So multi-pronged, of course, uh, guys have different directions to try and isolate areas like this to create a massive headache for a Hamas working in these regions. We'll see a further push, of course, down this road here. So branching out here, and what we have speculated about is the potential for then a meeting of the north and south down this road to split. So this runs all the way basically through here. So the IDF has currently split the north and the south, and could we split a split of the west and the, uh, uh, here we go, Whey! and the east here to try and isolate more of these regions as is going. So we're currently unsure, of course, no one really knows the end goal, what is actually a strategic victory here for Israel. They will talk about the elimination of Hamas. I've spoken that trying to eliminate one of these radical groups like this is basically impossible. Look at look at any other bloody example of a group like this. Very, very difficult and of course causing radicalization. How much time do they have diplomatically, politically in the global sphere? currently but that is where the movements are there is success moving through the front line but also large mistakes are being made and of course this will spread through the media really really badly and add fire to other things as we're seeing this really close off here legends that's it for today thank you very much i'll speak to you soon bye-bye